I'm Dr. Doug Kelly, Professor of Communication in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Professor of Relationship Ethics with the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics, and affiliate of the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict. I have the pleasure of introducing Elaine Howard Eklund, the Herbert S. Autry Chair in Social Sciences, Professor of Sociology, and Director of the Religion and Public Life Program at Rice University. Dr. Eklund's research explores how scientists in different nations understand religion, ethics, and gender. Most recently, she received a $2.9 million grant from the Templeton Religion Trust to examine how identities and beliefs are related to attitudes about science and religion. Dr. Eklund has authored over 80 research articles and six books, the latest of which is Why Science and Faith Need Each Other, Eight Shared Values That Move Us Beyond Fear. Welcome, Dr. Elaine Eklund. I'm a, a sociologist who for about the past 15 years has studied what scientists around the world think about religion and what people of faith and no faith um, think about science. But my own um, story has also been a part of my journey. And let me, let me read just a, a little bit to you. Um, I was 10 years old when I noticed that I could no longer make a fist. And over time, my feet started to swell and walking became painful if I stood for more than an hour. Yet my face looked like that of a healthy child. My doctors told my family after I was diagnosed with systemic arthritis that before I turned 20, I would probably lose the ability to walk, to carry a stack of books and to have children. Then my spine began to contort. And when I was 13, I wore a back brace for 22 hours a day in an effort to keep my spine from growing in a crooked direction. But despite what medical science predicted for me, I ran track in high school and despite what sociologists predict about kids who leave church when doubts about faith are not dealt with, um, as my own led illness led to many doubts about faith, I did may my, make my way back. And today I can walk and carry books. And if you met me on a Sunday morning, you'd likely find my daughter running around in church with a gang of her friends. I no longer doubt the power of medicine, but I've had six surgeries related to my disease, including two hip replacements. Yet doctors often look at my medical chart and prognosis and tell me, you're a walking reality, you're a walking miracle. There are people in my church who think that at least as far as my physical body goes, I might just be one. I've met Christian doctors who believe that God could have helped heal me completely, either through the medical tools they have or, uh, or through the doctors they believe are called to serve God. Some believe I have experienced divine healing and some wonder why there are days I still limp. Other doctors doubt the power of faith. and They talk to me about how prognoses change or they predict the disease will still take a turn for the worse. But one thing that really um, threads together um, both my studies as well as my personal experience is that science and faith are not just idea systems. They are realities that people live. They're communities of people that God loves and in my own story, I've needed to know people who really point the way for how these things can be held in tension. And I found that incredibly healing um, to see people who are able to point the way for me. Um, and in that way, I hope to, to point the way for others as well. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Dr. Jonathan Pettigrew. I'm an uh, associate professor in the Hugh Downs School of Human Communication at ASU. Uh, I'm excited to introduce to you today a colleague who has a vision to see life's ultimate questions answered. And he does that not just from the perspective of one discipline or even some multidisciplinary unit in the academy. Instead, please meet Dr. Justin Barrett. He, he has degrees in cognitive and developmental psychology. He studied at Calvin College and at Cornell University. He's worked at Oxford University and at Fuller Theological Seminary. He brings together uh, an excitement to understand life and to, to explore it from theological and scientific perspectives. Uh, he's been described as an academic entrepreneur, and no wonder, because he's not started just one or two centers, but five different centers of inquiry at 
uh, institutions of higher education. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Justin Barrett. Maybe you're like me and grew up loving the natural world. I loved learning about plants and animals, mountains, rivers, and thunderstorms. I was drawn to chemistry sets, microscopes, and telescopes. When science fairs rolled around, I was sure to enter. I wanted to be a scientist. Maybe you're like me and grew up in a Christian home. The home of my childhood saw reading and discussing the Bible, singing praise songs, praying, and people trying to live into the gospel. I wanted to follow Jesus. Maybe you're like me and you subtly received the message that doing science was not the best calling for a Christ follower. If you were really serious about following Jesus, you'd be a professional minister, not a scientist. If not a pastor, maybe a missionary. There are a few areas of science that were a bit suspect, but as a whole, it was fine. But in the hierarchy of Christian professions, the sciences rank pretty low. But I learned some things. As an undergraduate at Calvin College, I learned that there was this whole area of science, psychological and cognitive science, that I didn't know existed. I learned that even though I took the Bible seriously, I hadn't taken it seriously enough. I hadn't recognized my own rather crude interpretive approaches to it. I had so much to learn from it and about it. I learned that the whole world is God's, every bit of it. And every bit of it is a place where his people can participate in his kingdom. In graduate school at Cornell University, I learned that other Christ followers were few and many were afraid to be recognized. I learned that being a good science student wasn't enough. I needed to be theologically and biblically fluent. I needed to be better than the average scientist in being thoughtful about my beliefs, motives, and lifestyle. And above all, I needed to engage my colleagues with an attitude of care for them as people, not merely looking to score intellectual points. When I met with members of my doctoral committee, they sometimes turned from the research and wanted to know, from my perspective as a Christian, how to think about topics and problems that were personally meaningful to them. I hope, like me, you'll discover that the sciences need Christ followers contributing to them, recognizing that the sciences, like other tools for knowing, are gifts from God that can be put into service for his kingdom. I hope, like me, you'll find ways to encourage other Christ followers to do great science and also be resources for thinking scientifically within the body of Christ. I hope, like me, you'll feel joy as you become an increasingly integrated person living into your godly vocation as a scientist. Hi, this is Ross Emmett again. I am here to introduce Spencer Bansoff, who I have known since he was a graduate student at Duke University. He is now a tenured professor at Georgia State University. His primary field of research is environmental economics. He has published, however, a number of times in things that connect with our topics. He has a forthcoming essay on economics and theological ethics in the Journal of Economic Theology and Religion. And a long time ago, he edited a book called Keeping Faith, Losing Faith, Religious Belief and Political Economy, which is a book that looked at economists who were um, Christians and how their religious beliefs shaped their political economy. I actually contributed an essay to that volume and have known Spencer for a long time and I'm happy to have him here with us. When I think of integrating faith and science, I think of two main things. The first is the maxim of Augustine and Anselm, I believe so that I may understand, or the variant faith seeking understanding. That is to say, we begin with the posture of loving God in faith, and the wellspring of that faith is a love for the world he created, and hence, a love for understanding it. Science is one way to understand the world, but we don't approach the world as scientists first, seeking to understand in order to believe, or to test whether we should believe. Rather, faith motivates the science. By the same token, we don't do science as an act of an unrestrained will, seeking to control or dominate, to bend the world to our will. We seek to understand. The second thing I think of is actually being co-creators with God. God is a creator and he created us in his image, but isn't it interesting that he first created by speaking the world into existence? 
In the same way, when we as scholars tell a story about the way the world works or how it potentially could work, we're speaking model worlds into existence. If those models have no place for God in them, then we're creating idols. And if they have no truth or beauty, then they are godless. Our models should have room for God and for him to work. My own work focuses on the economics of environmental policy, how we use the world for material production, how markets and other socio socioeconomic processes allocate the blessings of nature to people, and how the incentives policy create and signals they send to people help coordinate or perhaps alternatively undermine social action to help the environment. When I first started my career, I accepted the view that most economists have of the world, that the good is defined by consumer sovereignty. That is, it's just defined by whatever individuals atomistically desire and summing them up into some kind of aggregate good. Increasingly, I'm skeptical of that view of the world. I don't want to define the good just by whatever human desires are, but by the good as God sees it. At the same time, I'm wary of leaps to social control or social engineering based on under our understanding of the good and more importantly on economic models that capture such a small part of the way the world really works. I'd like to seek to know the good as God knows it and to understand how that can work in the world as it is. My name is Dr. Lily Shea, an assistant professor of public policy and economics at ASU. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Hemisma. Dr. Hemisma is an associate professor of public administration and international affairs at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. She's also the director of Maxwell School's PhD program. As a public and labor economist, Dr. Hemisma's research has focused on health and nutrition programs, examining the consequences of food insecurity, health outcomes, and labor supply. For example, a recent project funded through the WT Grant Foundation examined the effects of the U.S. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, on post-secondary educational investments. Dr. Hemisma received her PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was an active member of the Graduate InterVarsity Chapter. She currently sits on the board of the Consortium of Christian Study Centers. I have never found it hard to align the concerns of my research with my faith, since I study the disadvantaged and our public efforts to serve them. While I use a lot of numbers and statistics, I think one can do this thoughtfully without dehumanizing those we study, and even with an attitude of wonder. I recently wrote a bit about this in Comment Magazine in a piece on statistics. But early in my career, I did have to reckon with the tensions that seem to be posed between the lifestyle of an academic scientist and the expected lifestyle of a Christian, especially a Christian mother. For my thoughts today, I want to share something I wrote while on the tenure track as a daily devotional for a group of Christian faculty. I hope that the fruit of my wrestling with this might encourage you. Following Christ and seeking tenure. It is easy to see ways in which the quest for tenure could seem antithetical to the lifestyle and goals of a Christian. Clearly we know that as Christians, we are to seek the kingdom of God, not a place among the world's intellectual elite. This sometimes means spending time in ways that does not maximize our research productivity. It often means relationships are of greater importance to us than to many others in our line of work. However, I think we sometimes worry too much about the tension between academic excellence and living out our faith. As an assistant professor reflecting on my own place on the tenure track, I have found comfort in seeing the ways in which God's calling to me as a Christian can enhance rather than detract from my work as a researcher. It seems to me that in the context of my academic work, being a Christian means my motives are more distinct than my actual output. For example, my priority as a Christian academic should be to build community and build knowledge, not build a personal empire. But if I truly care about building community and knowledge, I'll be doing what the rest of the world observes as networking. I will likely find collaborators if I'm doing this, and they will in some cases become meaningful relationships in my life, as well as improving the quality of my work. And if I truly care about serving society with my work, then I would wanna do work that examines something important, is not redundant, and will be published where it can have some influence. I think my colleagues, Christian and not, would be delighted to see me succeed in such a pursuit. In the end, I believe the motives I try to have as a Christian scholar are often quite consistent with the performance that will be judged by my peers. In doing this work, I will also make dear friends along the way, 
some of whom I would never meet at church. My colleagues bring insights that we in the church need, both scientifically and in opening our eyes to how Christians need to better represent ourselves in the academy. I can be more relaxed than others on the tenure track, knowing that I'm seeking God's guidance rather than man's approval. And just maybe by God's grace, I will get tenure. Thanks for letting me share this. While it took a move to another university before I was tenured, I continue to see God working actively in my endeavors on campus and professionally. I pray the same for my Christian colleagues here at the conference. Hi, I'm Ross Summit. I'm here again to welcome another member of the team talking about faith and economics. Mary Hirschfeld is professor of theology and economics of Villanova and the recent author of a book toward a humane economy, which looks at uses Thomas Aquinas's views of the market as a way of thinking about how we might have a vision of economic life that is better fit to uh, our true human nature than the economic analysis that we usually encounter. Mary is well fit for doing this because she herself has a PhD also in economics. She has a PhD from Harvard, where she studied with Larry Summers and Jeff Williamson. She went on to be a professor at Pomona College, which is where I met her. We were both historians of economics and had the chance to be at many conferences together. I'm happy to welcome Mary to join us today. So my story about faith and science is that I was a secular humanist who went into economics because I thought that the path to human flourishing around the world was by um, generating material prosperity for as many people as possible. The trouble that I had, though, was that the deeper I went into economics as I was studying it, the less I thought that material stuff had a lot to do with human happiness, especially in the West where we're all pretty rich already. In my own life, I would get a raise and I'd be so excited because now I could, you know, get a one bedroom apartment instead of a studio. And then the happiness would just kind of peter out. And it was felt like it was, it felt like it had nothing to do with anything actually. But God in his great mercy just sort of reached out to me and gave me this profound conversion where I was walking along as a secular humanist one day and then found myself the next day knocking on the door of the Catholic Church saying, I have no idea why I'm here, but I think God wants me to become Catholic. What happened in the next few years was this amazing uh, revolution in how I saw the world. Um, seeing God as the center of everything, the creator and author of all that is, it was, it was just amazing. And it put me on a path towards pursuing my own happiness that was exhilarating. So I ended up quitting my job to go study theology at Notre Dame, and I thought I was going to leave economics behind. But as I studied theology at Notre Dame, I came to see that all of the created world is a reflection of God's goodness, and that this one idea could help me understand economics better. Um, and, and the central insight is just, if you see everything around you as a reflection of the goodness of God, what you can see is that we need only so much in order to make us happy. And so I could look at my then one bedroom apartment and say, you know, this fits me really well. And, and you know, the way things are arranged in my living room, it's just harmonious and beautiful. And I could appreciate that as a reflection of God's goodness and find myself really happy with what I had. This one insight allows you to build a way of thinking about economics that can keep a lot of the insights that economists have, but resolve a lot of the tensions that they can't deal with. And so I found myself on this amazing intellectual adventure that began with my spiritual journey, where my science as an economist is better, and my life as a Christian is just unbelievable. So that's the story God has given me, and I'm so grateful for it. <laughs> 